<clears throat> than Peter Max had 500 years later. <laughs> the books Pete gave, gave, the, gave us changed our lives, and they have never stopped giving. Ask my brother John, who followed Pete into the pages of the Village Voice and worked at the Daily News before Pete did and long before I did. Quote, when I was eight and in the fourth grade, I, hunted, I haunted the local branch of the public library, a furtive spy ferreting out the wonders of the world, writes John, who is 14 months and one Vietnam War older than me. Our tenement home was, was without many things, but books were, not, were an inescapable part of the furniture. I brought the Knights of the Round Table, Texas Cowboys, and baseball heroes to our inner sanctum as rotating two-week guests, but I never remember actually owning a book until our oldest brother, Pete, who mysteriously lived somewhere beyond Brooklyn, strode into our kitchen with a thin package wrapped in brown paper. Excuse me. Pete handed me the package, <clears throat> smiled and said, the world can be yours if you know stories. I tore the paper from the package revealing an oversized golden book bound in glossy thick cardboard. The pictures were brown and black, had brown and black illustrations from ancient Greek pottery. The Iliad was my first and best passport, a magic carpet and a map to a bigger life. It told of war, beauty, betrayal, courage and cowardice, disappointment and triumph. It was adventure and history and it was mine. In the 60 years since, Johnny writes, there has rarely been a day that I haven't silently thought of and thanked Pete for unlocking the doors of Troy, Mount Olympus, Sparta, Thebes, and all the provinces beyond Brooklyn. That's the kind of big brother Pete has been and continues to be for all of us. You can't visit him at his Brooklyn home these days without leaving with a book, sometimes a box of them. Pete didn't just teach me about life, he saved my life a few times when I was lost in the purple haze of the late 1960s and in the lost last call saloons of the early 1990s. I can't count the number of strangers who have told me that Pete's book, A Drinking Life, helped save their lives or the lives of loved ones. I nod at them <clears throat> knowingly because Pete helped do that for me too, 27 years ago. Before the science fiction magic of the fax machine and the modem, I learned to type on Pete's Hermes 3000 manual typewriter as Pete dictated his columns to me from Belfast, Mexico, Italy, the Middle East, and Los Angeles, learning by osmosis how a newspaper column was reported, designed, and constructed, the sentences always electrified with action verbs and ending with a concrete noun. I was living with Pete in Dublin at 16 when he wrote his first novel, A Killing for Christ, which was reissued this year, a half century later. I saw him map out his narrative on index cards as he pinned, to, pinned them to cork boards. I read the books that he read on the craft of writing, like John Brain's writing a novel and the elements of style and the collected Paris Review interviews with great writers. I learned from Pete what a that a writer is working when gazing out a window. I also learned the ass in the chair discipline it takes to build a novel chapter by chapter. I learned from Pete how to write a screenplay by watching him write one and reading the pages as they came out of the typewriter. I have earned a living from all of these crafts. I've had a ringside seat across six, de six decades to a brilliant American writer at work. It has been a master class of a life well lived. For those who only know Pete Hamill by his writing, I can assure you that his body of work really does mirror the life of the man. For his family, Pete will always just be Pete, the go-to big brother who comes to bail you out at night court and <clears throat> who used to sign his three-page single-space pa uh, letters from faraway places as Big Brother Pete. Two of our brothers, Tom and Joey, are no longer with us in the flesh. But as Pete has often said, as long as one of us is alive, so will we all. So on behalf of the six other children of Billy Hamill and Annie Devlin, I thank you all for coming here tonight to honor Pete Hamill, our beloved big brother. Sorry, Pedro. I couldn't think of ending this on a more beautiful concrete noun.
about a collective hand for all of our great speakers here today. Like that 55 Dodgers lineup, you all knocked it out of the park. Let's all welcome our guest of honor, Pete Hamill. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank everybody here. Uh, let me have the... There's a water here for you. Oh, great. First, among the, the people I'd like to thank immediately is Loretta Glucksman. Uh, she is... She has done so much work with Glucksman Ireland House alone at, and here at NYU, uh, taking the green beer and the shamrocks out of the Irish cliche, <laughs> and getting the real story tell, told, which is always better than the myth. Uh, Loretta, uh, thank you so much. Thank Miriam Nyhan, too, for <laughs> handling all the details. When I wanted certain people to come, my beautiful wife would deal with Miriam, and somehow they'd find two extra seats somewhere. Uh, just wonderful people. Um, but to be here tonight is at the same time uh, amazingly moving, uh, particularly to hear some of it without being laid out in a coffin in that <laughs> aisle right over there, and at the same time humbling. Um, in, in my lifetime, I've been one of the luckiest human beings on the earth. I met, I had a chance to do something with my life, and I took it. Um, I, I, I started well before I knew I had started to become a writer. I, 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 forgive me for having to read some of this, but the first person that I'd have to thank in my personal life is my beautiful wife, Fukiko. <laughs> Dennis was right. She she helped me get through some hard times. Uh, she was more very literally part of the vow we took uh, about uh, in, in good times or bad, uh, in, hel in health, and hard times to get on with your life. And I was lucky to have her. She, about five years ago, I had a horrendous health crisis. Uh, I, I went, I, I had diabetes too. I had somehow in a hospital, I had had a heart attack. I had fallen and broken both hips. Um, I, uh, why or how, I don't remember. And I was in a coma for more than a week. And Fukiko never left intensive care while some of the doctors thought that I would never get out of it. She was there. And 
I don't remember what she was whispering in my brain, but she would whisper at me. She remembers it. And then, and then at one point, I came out of the coma. The first word I said was in Spanish. <laughs> Agua. <laughs> she knew and brought me a sip of water <laughs> and told the nurses and the doctors that I wasn't done yet. And after that, she's had to deal with the dailiness of my life and my recuperated, my hobbled life. I used to love walking the city. I even fancied myself what Baudelaire called a flaneur, uh, which I would never mention to anybody at the tabloids I worked at. <laughs> uh, but I loved on days off walking the streets and standing in the corner and watching people and imagining their lives or talking to them and listening to them. Uh, I haven't been able to do that the same way anymore. But I get out of the house always with my wife. Uh, she's my, my love, my partner, my chief dietitian, <laughs> my exercise coach, my literary critic, my bodyguard, and my fellow Knicks fan. If there is an afterlife, like all Nick fans, we'll both skip purgatory. <laughs> she knew how to play basketball in college. It was a sport I had never played and taught me also about how to watch basketball. Until I opened my eyes and whispered the word, I didn't know really what I was going to be able to do for the rest of my life. Good times and bad, sickness and health. But I would hope all of you, honey, please stand, would welcome and cheer her. This story is a complicated one, and I'm not going to keep you all here for, uh, away from that four-letter word that starts with F and ends with D. Um, <laughs> but there were many people who helped me get here tonight for an honor like this. The ones who guided me in the honorable craft that I have practiced since 1960. There are few here. My friend Ed Kozner and his wife Julie are here. And I worked. He came the very first night I started and explained to me how to, how to uh, slug a story, which meant that in the, what they called books, which were four sheets of paper with three sheets of carbon paper, upper left-hand corner, you put a word like um, slay or uh, mugging or whatever, and became the name of the story. He explained to me, don't call it kill, or they'll kill the story. <laughs> One copy went to eat each of several editors fact-checking and everything, and the other went right to the composing room, which was the final edit. Uh, but among 
the people who are not here tonight, who are not sitting near my family or Loretta and others just behind them. Those are my friends. Uh, there's a whole lot of people who are now part of what my friend, the great newspaper comic strip artist, Milton Kniff once called, a ghostly echelon of good guys. Jimmy Breslin, Jack Newfield, Murray Kempton, Jimmy Wexler, who arranged my first tryout at the Post, Paul Sand, my newspaper father, Jimmy Cannon, Milton Gross, Norman Poirier, Gene Grove, the photographers Barney Stein, Artie Pomerantz, Louis Liotta, along with a few of my oldest and closest friends, Tim Lee, Jimmy Vlasto, Jose Chegui Torres. I could keep, keep naming others for another hour. But special thanks must also go to the women who helped nourish my craft, either through friendship or through their writing. People like Gloria Steinem, Germaine Greer, Susan Sontag, Martha Gellhorn, Joan Didion, Edith Wharton, Catherine Ann Porter, Paula Fox, Francis Fitzgerald, Mary McCarthy, people who deserve to be honored as much as I'm being honored tonight. All of them. They are. And also the women who I worked with at Dorothy Schiff's New York Post. Betsy Luce, Judy Michelson, Fern Maria, Helen Durer, Hope McLeod, and later the splendid Nora Ephron. Thank Nick Pelleggi, Nora's husband, who is here. <laughs> Sitting with his cousin, Gay Talese, who helped me learn how to write before I ever met him by reading him in the New York Times. All of them help bring the great complex city that we live in into vivid life, the tragedy and the joy, all helped educate everybody in this room, and me too. Some of you know as Dennis mentioned and several have mentioned that I dropped out of the great Jesuit high school, uh, Regis, when I was 16, after two years. Uh, they had given me a great education, four, two years of Latin, a year of German. Uh, the only course I failed uh, was algebra because I couldn't figure out the story, you know. <laughs> what? What? Uh, <laughs> so I went to the Brooklyn Navy Yard, my first adult job. I had worked as a delivery boy and other things, and had my first newspaper job delivering the Brooklyn Eagle here in Brooklyn uh, on 15th and six, uh, Fifth Street and Sixth Street between Eighth Avenue and Prospect Park West. Uh, I now live in a building like the ones I used to deliver <laughs> the paper to. Um, but I left the job because I thought that there was a, a, a financial problem in our family, and the, the first of what I later called the Tenement Commandments was family first. And I had to, I was the oldest son, and therefore I better go out and earn some money and help bring it home to the house. The day I told my mother that, she was the first day I ever saw her cry. And that day, I vowed 
that I would do something with my life to make her feel she did not waste what she did by helping me get whatever I got. I could draw. I decided I want to be a comic strip artist. I could draw Dick Tracy. I could draw Little Orphan Annie. I had trouble drawing the elegant drawings of Milton Kniff in Terry and the Pirates, but I could draw. And they were all the great narrative strips that were stories, usually in three panels in a daily. This happened, and this happened, and as a result, this happened. Tune in tomorrow. Um, but one day in the Navy Yard, a friend of my father, another immigrant from Belfast named Eddie McManus, who worked at the Navy Yard, came to me and said, what the hell are you doing here? I said, what do you mean? He said, I said get the hell out of here. Join the Army or the Navy and get that GI Bill and make something of yourself, which is what I did. The GI Bill was one of those government programs that gave millions of people a chance at life. And I was one of them. Uh, when I got out of the Navy, uh, I went right to uh, the cartoonists and illustrators school for a while, to Mexico City, where I uh, began to, I, I was entranced with the mural painters and first began to write seriously with my own name on it and came back and uh, again worked and had a chance at going to the post and trying to become a newspaper man. But I was preparing myself a lot earlier. The first book I remember reading was when I was five. My mother had gotten me a library card before I could read, like so many of the tenement mothers who really ran the, 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 the household who did the budgets and paid the rent and got the clothes for the kids and, and uh, took care of everybody. They knew that the road out of poverty started at the library. And we were three blocks from a library and two blocks from the most beautiful park in Brooklyn, Prospect Park. So I became a real person in the library. And the first book was that I remember being able to read after going through these little squiggles that my mother identified, sitting on her lap and looking that they make words and that those words make stories. The first book was the story of Babar, by, uh, which is still in print all these years later. Um, I, I started reading it, and each time I read it, because I read it over and over, uh, I burst into tears myself because the scene at the beginning of the, almost the beginning of the book, is some hunter with a rifle shooting the mother of Babar. He then wanders off into nowhere and ends up in some city called Paris, where an old woman took pity in him and taught him how to read, and taught him how to read more, and bought him a beautiful green jacket. And I thought, he must have been an Irish elephant, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah. And, and, and from there, I began my reading life. I was lucky because of the library that was there, that was put, put there 
through the generous heart of, a, of another immigrant named Andrew Carnegie, who came from Scotland when he was 10 and had a Burry accent and went to live in Pittsburgh with with no public libraries. And he went to a private club to try to get in to look at their their books. And they heard the burr the the burr in the tongue. They looked at his clothes. Not for you, pal. Come back someday. He never forgot it. And though he could be a brutal businessman, he never forgot where he came from. And when he was, and he did not want to be the richest guy in the cemetery. He opened 1,600 libraries in the United States alone. He opened libraries in Ireland and in Scotland. And he opened the library that gave me my life. And it's still there on 6th Avenue and 9th Street. And they've even got a ramp now, I'm told, so I can get up all those goddamn stairs. <laughs> and, that's, and that's where I began to be a reader. And it was important because you can't be a writer unless you're a reader. From that library, I sailed to Treasure Island, guided by Robert Louis Stevenson and the illustrations of N.C. Wyeth. As an American kid, I found out about the daily life of the Romans, stories of Irish immigrants who made it in the United States, and the life and death of Abraham Lincoln, which is more and more important to me when Jack Roosevelt Robinson came to play with the Brooklyn Dodgers. I wanted to understand all that. And he ended up as one of my favorite Republicans. (laughs) Because when he had to play in the South, in his first year playing for Montreal after uh, he was signed by Branch Rickey, He did his first year in Montreal. When they went on the road, and some of the minor league teams were in the South, uh, he wasn't allowed to stay in the same hotel as his team. The South was then democratic and segregationist. The big change would come much later into what we now have. But there was more than that. There was romance in that room, in the library. I, my biggest accomplishment as a boy was busting out of the Chateau d'If with the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, I learned to see revealing details through the writing of Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. I heard real human beings talking through the work of a fellow named Mark Twain. But some days when I was with my brother Tom, we had to go to the main library, which had opened in 1941, uh, to get more research done. And he would go to the science section, since he had the science gene, and he would end up at Brooklyn Tech Uh, City University and then Northwestern before becoming one of the founders of NASA, uh, the founding team that was at NASA. Um, And when I would leave with Tommy after a trip to the main library, I'd look back and chiseled on the wall was a slogan Herein are enshrined the longings of great hearts. And I would think, Christ, maybe someday I could be a great heart, whatever the hell it means. <laughs> and you are, Pete. and uh, <laughs> thank you, Melody. And 
Now I'm, I'm deep into extra innings. I realize that the dwelling on the past can be dangerous. It often leads to one of the most common emotions among New Yorkers, nostalgia, because of it's an immigrant city. There's all kinds of immigrants who might have left at four years old to come here, but remember the old country uh, where they ran barefoot in the grass in the summertime. Uh, it, it's a city of rapid change so that the city we are in now is not the same as the one 10 years ago. Uh, so nostalgia, to me, is legitimate. It's about a life lived, not a sentimental life conjured in a movie by strangers who never lived the life we're talking about. Now, I hope that all of us can live long enough to see some of the meanness and darkness of our current era change. I am, <laughs> I am optimistic. I can't help myself. Uh, I think it will. I think we shall, we. I think it's possible once again for an intelligent, progressive and an intelligent uh, conservative to sit down at a table, learn from each other, and try to figure out how to make a possible vision real. I think that is possible, and I hope I live long enough to see it. Uh, I get consolation for my personal life since I can't go out banging columns away anymore. I find myself getting consolation reading the classics, the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, the Nicomachean ethics of Aristotle. I had a copy of it from when I was at a private reading group when I was 22 down in the village. I had my copy with a teacher named Tom McMahon who helped about six of us all from Brooklyn to get beyond what we're getting in school. And I loved the copy I had. All the wrong stuff was underlined. <laughs> I, the things I liked the sound of were underlined and the important points in the uh, Aristotle's ethics were, and I cherished it and had it until we had a fire about 10 years ago and it was burned up along with letters from my mother while I was in the Navy and a whole lot of other stuff. Most of all now, I'm reading Marcus Tullius Cicero, particularly his book, a short, long, uh, a long, short book, a short, long book on old age. <laughs> he really sees old age as something we can all manage, especially if we have a garden and a library. <laughs> so he, he himself knows, knew that you had to live your life and that the goal in life was wisdom, not to become the baddest ass on the block, not to become some dope with a gun sitting in sneering at neighbors, not to be 
the richest guy in the cemetery, but to be wise, to give counsel to those who need it, who if you see an old lady fall, help her get up, uh, because someone's going to have to help you when you fall. Cicero uh, wrote his book on old age in the year 44 BC. He was assassinated a year later after being de de declared an enemy of the state. The book is alive today. Nobody can name the people that order is killing except scholars who have studied it. But I think someone like Cicero shows the way for all of us and reminds us that the true goal is as old as the Greeks and Romans, a combination of experience and reading, often best taught by committing mistakes or suffering failure, then learning from them, admitting your responsibility, and never committing those mistakes again. The wise man or wise woman can be kind to strangers, can disagree with respect for the other, can help those who are weaker without fawning before those who are stronger, to breathe deeply, sleep soundly, and get, a, get up each morning singing a song, and then to laugh. Remember always, that in our country, there are some very important four-letter words. Work, hope, love, and above all, the world that makes all of them possible. Free. I promised my wife I wouldn't sing. <laughs> so I'll do just two lines before we all say goodnight. <laughs>